welcome back everyone. It's been a while since I did a video. It's been really, really difficult to try and make one with my neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. <clears throat> today, today was a rough day as far as that goes. Um, I woke up this morning and I wasn't able to move my neck. I, I still can't move it very well it's still really quite a lot of nerve pain up in here and over my shoulder not you probably won't see much of my right hand because it's uh curled up into a little ball that's called a contracture there's atrophy in my my arm and my hand but hey you know what i i I like doing these videos, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the video. One of the things I've been continuously talking about with people lately, outside of the topic of don't punish pain and the pain dilemma of the opiate epidemic, is sort of like explaining people about like the sort of philosophical take that I stand on things. Um, sometimes I call myself an existentialist. Sometimes I call myself sort of an anarcho-nihilist. Uh, really, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. I hope you really like my beautiful, disgusting <laughs> mohawk. It's beautiful, disgusting. So, true, true goth way. I know I'm not in full goth attire. That's really hard to do with neurogenic TOS, putting on all that shit. My arm doesn't work right, so, but uh, hey, at least I'm, I'm still wearing my poet shirt. And if you're an old school goth, then you know what that is. But anyway, I've been, I've been talking about philosophical standpoints as of like, um, the, sort of the existential crisis that society dwells in. One of the things that I've, I've particularly noticed that I've been talking to people about is that we, we tend to live in a society, for one, you, you have two variables that I, I particularly pay attention to, is, for one, <clears throat> we struggle with meaning and purpose. Many of us do not like the idea of going out and working for a multi-conglomerate corporation, and that that becomes the meaning of your life. And... We do this instead of actually seeking out the things that we enjoy, the things that we want to do. I find this to be extremely... I, it's, it's unhealthy, and it leads to an existential crisis. For anyone living in this society, this whole sort of notion of wake up, throw up, put your clothes on, go through a depressive hell making your way to a job that you absolutely can't stand. And the only reason you're doing it is because you got, you know, you got to put the roof over your head, you got to be able to buy food and and all the other variations of things that you need and desire and want. And and I I don't think as far as capitalism goes, it's like I I mean system of commodity and commerce, trade, and all that. And it's like I'm not directly opposed to capitalism as much as I'm critiquing the social impact. So, you know, we, we go to our little jobs that we hate, and that becomes the, def the, the definition of our lives. Well, we're a social animal. We're a social creature, and, and this is not what we're meant to do. We, we do not exist solely or specifically to work our entire lives. That's, that's not what defines our lives. We're social creatures. We're social animals. And one of the things that we enjoy doing is interacting with our friends, family, and loved ones. And when you're working 40 hours a week with days off separated and everyone having different days off and different schedules, it's really hard to accomplish as a human being to actually be human and inter interact with other human beings socializing and, and touching each other and being there for each other. It's very, very difficult. It's very, 
difficult to pursue your actual aspirations, the things that you desire and want to do and the things that you want to define your life as. That's very difficult. The other, the other thing that I've noticed as sort of a, a prelude to an existential nightmare is in our society, we, we tend to live in one where society tells us not to express what it calls negative emotions. These emotions usually tend to be depression, melancholia, sadness, grievance, bereavement, grief, things along that pattern. Surprisingly, society doesn't really view anger and violence as much of a negative emotion as it should. It seems to be okay with that as long as it's in a, a particular parameter. So viol violence and anger, that's okay. Those are okay emotions. Those are normal. Sadness, depression, melancholia. Oh no, that's not normal. Something's wrong with you. And you certainly shouldn't communicate that to others around you. You need to pay someone to communicate that. And I find this to be particularly psychologically unhealthy. At the time of depression, melancholia, sadness, grievance, all that, that is the time in a person's life where they probably need to talk to someone the most. And the time that they need to talk to someone the most is the time that society says that they need to say the least. It's very psychologically damaging. Very psychologically damaging. Like I said, it, it should be no secret to anyone watching this channel Anyone I've interacted with in the comments section, regardless of where they stand on the political side, even if they have a political ideology that I can't stand. <laughs> Fascist. <clears throat> yeah. Even they understand this concept, that we are social animals, that we are meant to socialize. We... When we are feeling sad, melancholia, depression, it's the most important time to reach out and feel compassion from another person, to feel love and belonging and a sense of connection and be able to talk about it. This is a coping mechanism that we have adapted to deal with these things. So why society considers these, these emotions to be negative, I don't understand. Because it's part of being human. We, we do not live in a world devoid of tragedy. And we are compassionate creatures. We do care about our own kind. We care about other people. Care about other humans. So like I said, at, at a time in a person's life when it's the most important that they reach out to someone and talk about it, they are encouraged by society not to. I have no idea why that is, but I would encourage that to change. I would say talk about it anyway. And I think what you'll find in bereavement, especially when you've lost someone you love, people say, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, like, I don't know what to say. That's fine that you don't know what to say. Just listen. Because the probability that, and, and people keep apologizing for bringing it up, the real reality is in the back of that person's mind, so this, the voice of society is sitting there saying, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. But I bet you that person, in reality, that's all they want to talk about. Same with pain. People with chronic pain, that's all they want to talk about is their pain. 
because it's negatively impacting their quality of life. And talking about it is a way to cope. And having people say, I'm so sorry you're going through that, and tell you that they care about you, validates you as a human being. So these are some of the sort of talking bullet points that I've gone over with people that I've been interacting with. I have physical therapists, doctors, things like that. I've been explaining to them these sort of existential crises. We wonder where they come from in society, and it's like, well, look at society itself and the type of ideals that it fosters. It fosters this ideal of being something that we are not. We, we, we like negative, what, what we're calling negative emotions, that's a part of being human. Emotions are, are a vast spectrum. There, there's, there's a huge spectrum of human emotions. It's not just happy and mad and complacency, and that's it. No. No, there, there's a huge array. And just because you feel sad and depressed doesn't mean that you're weird or abnormal. It actually means quite the opposite. It means you are normal. It means you're human. And I think it's important that... I, I think anyone on this channel probably does it anyway, is that when they do feel these types of emotions, they probably talk about them anyway. I ignore social standards quite often because I find them completely irrelevant. When I feel melancholia, when I feel sadness, when I feel depressed, I talk about it as openly as possible. In fact, pretty open book. I will talk about anything that has happened in my lifetime, anything and everything. And people get really weird about that. They think it's odd. They're, they're, they're like, you know, you're so comfortable talking about these things. And it's like, why, why shouldn't I be? We're, we're, we're both human. We're all human. We can identify. We can relate. We've all been through, most of us have been through tragic incidents things. I mean, we, we, we can empathize and sympathize. I don't, I don't understand like why talking about how my, my little brother died is such a secret. Why, why should I, why should that be a secret? If you want to know why he died, I'll tell you. It's not a secret. I'm not uncomfortable talking about it. He died from an overdose. He overdosed on heroin and rotted in his apartment for seven days and I had to clean it up. Was it tragic? Yeah. Did it hurt? Oh, yeah. It's the most emotionally painful thing I've ever experienced. But you know what? I'm not the only one. And when I say it's the most emotionally painful thing I've ever experienced, I guarantee you there's people out there that can relate and identify with that and agree. And I can also sit here and tell you that I know what it's like to lose a little brother. I have no idea what it's like to be a parent to lose a child. So I don't know what, it, what, what it's like for my dad or my mom. I have no idea what they went through. What they went through is something completely different than what I went through. It's on a different level, because that was their son. That was their youngest son. I know what it's like to lose a little brother, and I can tell you that was the most emotionally painful thing I've ever experienced. Now, for the e list that I'm sure will come out and start commenting on that, let me explain that, well, yes, that level of pain was quite a lot to endure. It also helps me appreciate things on the flip side that, again, when something beautiful is in front of me, or, or when 
like I, I look at the relationship I have with my husband and, and I think about the type of person that he is. You know, he's honest, he's kind, he's caring, he's he's faithful. It's like I can appreciate that with a new perspective because I went through something so dark. If you're surrounded by darkness, the tiniest amount of light is blinding. And you have way more appreciation for that tiny amount of light being surrounded by darkness. It's a beautiful thing. And maybe that's why I'm so fascinated with things that are dark. It's because that is my projection of how I view the world around me is being a very dark, macabre place. It's something I feel comfortable in and safe. So I, I, I like it. I like to be a little bit scared. I like it. Being a little bit scared reminds me when I see something that's beautiful and peaceful, like a little hippie, it's like, wow, I probably wouldn't appreciate that if I wasn't surrounded by darkness all the time. But again, the existential crisis that happened within, the, we're seeing across society, people are so confused, they don't understand. Who wants their life to be defined as, I worked at company X my whole life, unless that company has done something miraculous that goes down in history books, it's really not that interesting. Like, let's, let, let's say that you work for Coca-Cola. Do you want working for Coca-Cola to be the defining factor of who you are in your lifetime? My guess is probably not. If you're somebody who works for Walmart, do you want that to be the defining factor of who you were in your lifetime? Probably not. McDonald's, probably not. Burger King, probably not. On and on and on and on. Now, my, my father, he designs circuit boards for GPS units. If he wants that to be the defining factor of who he was in his lifetime, I can understand that. Because he's pretty much paved the way for what's happening in the future. He could be looked at one day as being one of the chief people of like how that came into being. So that's interesting. But for many of us, or our jobs be, are not worthy of that title. This is not something that we want to be the defining moment or the defining point of our lives. And thus we enter into an existential crisis. And despite what the weird far right people say about having a child changes your perspective on life and that it gives you meaning and purpose and blah 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 i have thus to this date met two people that have a child <clears throat> and yet they're still struggling with self identity which i find to be very bizarre i've never had that experience of struggling with self identity and they too struggle with an existential crisis, even more so probably than those without children, because their existential crisis incorporates their child as far as, oh my God, what kind of world am I bringing my child into? I created a life, and their life is going to be dictated, managed, and defined by what company And they struggle even more with the existential crisis than people without kids. I find that fascinating.
And in case you don't know what an existential crisis is, it's um, basically where you've gotten to the point where you understand that you have more freedoms and there's, there's more things you can do than what is told to you by society and the world around you. <clears throat> you know, like... Why do I have to dress this way? Why do I have to behave this way? Such as displaying negative emotions, what they call negative emotions, depression and stuff like that. You can, you can. And you realize that many of these little boundaries and restrictions are superficial and don't actually exist. They're made up. And it bothers you. And then you start wondering what the point and purpose of all of it is. You know, what am, what am I doing? What am I doing here? What am, what am I doing with my life? Like, why, why do I have to subject myself to this? And you freak out. You break down. Existential philosophers would recommend that you introduce some spontaneity to your life to bring back some kind of uncontrollable variable. And, and that brings some kind of excitement, like, to understand that there are aspects of life that are beyond your control. Somehow helps us cope with that existential crisis of meaning and purpose. But ultimately, many existential philosophers will also argue that meaning and purpose of life is subjective, and it differs from person to person. Everyone is going to have a different reason to the point and purpose of their life. Some people want to be philosophers. Some people want to be physician or physicians. Some people want to be theoretical physicists. I mean, poets, painters, writers. And in our society, those things have lost monetary value. So you have great thinkers in this world doing manual labor jobs because great thinking in the society we currently live in has not really any monetary value. And that's kind of sad. Anyway, I think I'm going to end it there for now. I wanted to put something out there, you know, something. Because I'm, I'm not like many YouTubers. I'm not doing this for the money. I'm not pushing my, you know, like, fans only. I'm not pushing... Patreon advertisements, anything like that. I don't. I don't give a fuck about whether or not this channel gets monetized or not. The point is is conveying ideas to an audience. Maybe you agree with them. Maybe you don't. That's one of the beauties of being alive. Being exposed to different ideas. I, I guess that's the, the point and purpose to me as philosophy. Ideas. <clears throat> Find them very, very fascinating. They can divide us. They can make us hate each other. They can create... They, 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 they can create... What's the word I'm looking for? Schism. They can also bring us together. They can also help us understand. And, and the ones that I think that are most interesting are the ones that point out things that are uncomfortable truths instead of confirmation biases. I find that to be true to many people who say, I like the truth. <clears throat> A lot of the times what, what they mean when they say that, they don't like the truth. What they mean they like confirmation bias. They only like the truths that support the things that they like, their, their narrative. 
I'm more interested in the uncomfortable truths. Sometimes objective truth or objective reality is pessimistic. Sometimes it's optimistic. Most times I find it to be a little bit of both. So with that, I will leave you to your thoughts. Feel free to like, share, subscribe, comment, hit the bell button on any channel you're subscribed to, that kind of drill, you know. Um, just because I'm not in this for the money doesn't mean that I'm not interested in spreading ideas. And and feel free to comment, even if you disagree. The the only thing that I've I've been really <laughs> pointing out on a certain someone is <clears throat> their lack of sort of integrity. They um certain person has a tendency to just be rude, name call, call call people things like stupid and idiots and it's like, okay, that's that's not necessary. Um that that's that's something I expect out of the uh the bigots. It's not something I expect out of someone that calls themselves a philosopher. That's not... I, I expect more out of that. Anyway. Support the idea of choices, not one's ability to impose one's will on others against their own will. That's, that's true anarcho-nihilism, isn't it? Well, why, why, I'll tell you this. Why, why don't you put in the comments section what you personally, or what little box you put me in or label that you put on me? Am I a nihilist? Am I an anarcho-nihilist? Am I an anarchist? Am I a socialist libertarian? You, you tell me what you think. It should be fun. All right. Out.